So I'm super excited to be here today. Cisco Live is one of my favorite events. Uh, as an engineer, I, I love hanging out with 20,000 other engineers and kind of talking about the tech. And uh, over the last few days, you've heard about the network and the network intuitive and how that can be used in many applications. So for the next 30 minutes, what I'm going to do is walk you through a few examples of how the network can be one of your most powerful assets from a security perspective. Now, my first Cisco Live was in 2014 when I ran the cloud group. And in 2014, from a security perspective, the biggest issues were around DDoS, water holes, SQL injection, layered stacks, et cetera. Little did we know that the year before, there were a billion plus user credentials, emails, passwords stolen. And since 2013, over 10 trillion data records have been lost or stolen. And of course today, it's getting even worse with IoT botnets steering massive amounts of data to web applications, even taking out authoritative servers. We have fish tanks connected to the network collecting information and siphoning it off of the enterprise, or malware, crypto mining, et cetera. So in order to frame the conversation, I thought it would be best to set up an equation so that we can kind of think about how the network fits into all of this, how we can leverage it going forward. So I've got a very simple model when I think about security. We have an infinite number of attackers with infinite resources and an infinite amount of time against the lone defenders, the ones that are protecting the enterprise. And of course, on the attacker side, you only have to be successful once. One entry into the enterprise and then the trouble begins. On the defender side, you have to know about every hole, every full stack capability to make sure that you're protecting those valuable assets. So this is a very asymmetric equation. How can we balance this equation? Well, we do that by using the network and other security appliances as sensors so that if there's an attack locally anywhere in the world, we can then see that attack, gather that information, and then publish it broadly, whether it's in policy around segmentation, whether it's security around email or web or firewalls or cloud, whatever. We gather this information, curate it all together, and then push the result out into the network and other appliances. And the size of Cisco and the scale of Cisco we collect a tremendous amount of information, massive amounts. And the group that ties it all together is Talos, which is a group of 300 of the world's best security experts taking in this massive amount of data, organizing it and pushing it out. How many of you went to the Talos Research Forum on Sunday? Raise, raise your hand if you did that. Okay, look, here's a, here's a hint for next Cisco Live. You've got to sign up for the Talos Forum. If you have any interest in security, regardless if it's on the network side or full stack, sign up, but sign up early. It's sold out almost immediately. So uh, hidden trick, sign up for that, you're gonna love it. And from the amount of data perspective, I just want to show you how Cisco views the world. Talos blocks 20 billion, billion threat events every day. That's five times the number of Google searches every day. 
Cisco, with our DNS capability, processes 120 billion DNS queries every day. That's a 30th of the internet. We see 20 million unique pieces of malware every day. On and on it goes. And of course, you know, other people, if you're looking here and you're looking at, let's say, competitor D, what do they see? They see the security landscape through a particular keyhole. They may be a firewall provider or a email proxy provider. And they look at the world through an endpoint or a firewall or an email. Cisco, because of the network built on that network and the comprehensive portfolio on top of it, we get this kind of much more broader comprehensive view. And of course the world is only getting more complicated as we go into digitization. So now we have mobile users and web applications where the traffic is encrypted. You don't even see it. So you lose visibility. Workloads are moving to the cloud. So you lose control with shadow IT and DLP. And then of course, the malware is getting much more sophisticated with lateral transfers across the network as we combine traditional malware with worm-like behavior. So I'm gonna walk through each of these as examples, visibility through encrypted traffic, looking at SD-WAN and how we can protect cloud workloads, and our visibility platform around gathering the information from the network to see how the network in each case is a fundamental element of your security response. Let me first begin by kind of defining what we mean as the network. We have campus, WAN, data center, and traditionally, we've surrounded this entire network with firewalls and proxies. It was a simple world. We were able to do network segmentation with ACLs and rules and policies, and then protect the enterprise. Of course, as you heard from David Geckler yesterday, the network has changed, the people using the network has changed, and so we have to have a tighter coupling around the network and the context of the network. That is the network intuitive. And you saw through examples yesterday around healthcare and data assurance, looking at policy, looking at automation, the first example I'm going to provide for you is around analytics, of how we can use the network analytics in a security context. So it's the same playbook, the network intuitive, coupling the contextual piece with the infrastructure, but now through the lens of a security application. And the one I'm going to use is encrypted data. So today about 60, 70% of the data is encrypted. That's a good thing. Gardner suggests 80% going forward. If you want to see something really cool here, if you go over into the security part of this event, in the back, there's a threat wall where we look at all the threats that are going on currently today in this event. And we do see crypto mining, we do see malware, we do see a lot of stuff. It's all published on the wall for you to see. And when I checked last night, 80% of the traffic was encrypted. So what happens when you have encrypted traffic? Of course, from a user perspective, it's secure. I have a secure link between me and the application. And from a privacy perspective, that's good. However, 40% of the malware that we see is embedded in encrypted traffic. 50% of our customers that we talk to say they can't see malware once it's encrypted. So encryption is a problem from the security operations perspective. 
And how can we deal with that using the network? Well, if you use the CAT 9K, CAT 9K not only sends up information in a traditional sense around NetFlow, but it has enhanced NetFlow. So we take with our StealthWatch capabilities, we look across the network, seeing all the traffic patterns out there. But with the 9K, we're able to see that traffic in a much more nuanced, detailed way. And it's those subtle patterns it's those subtle behaviors, whether it's traffic and flow frequency, or stop-stop times and the durations, or source and destination in a classic way. These subtle patterns, we take all this information, put it through our large data analytics platform, StealthWatch, which is all based on machine learning and other things, and then spit out the result and say, we can actually detect this as malware without any decryption of the traffic itself. A unique capability enabled by the network fundamentally from the Catalyst 9K. And so using that capability, we can see malware and encrypted traffic, you have security and privacy, and of course a very, very high detection capability. Let me go on to the next example, which is around cloud. So as more and more applications move to the cloud, of course from a user perspective, we're now mobile users, we're not hairpinning our traffic back to HQ with VPNs, so we have direct access, but it's also fundamentally changing the branch. So branches are also having direct internet access to the cloud, and how can we protect them? Well, we started down the road with DNS, we added proxy, we added CASB, we added a, a host of capabilities in our cloud service, so now that we're able to go from just simple DNS overlays to routing traffic to the network, how can we do that in a simple way? And the way that we do it is by leveraging software-defined WAN. In an SD-WAN scenario, whether it's with Meraki or Viptela or others, you're able to very simply route traffic, whether it's MPLS traffic back to HQ, direct internet access, or secure direct internet access by taking those functions that were on-prem and now moving them into the cloud itself. And so we call this the secure internet gateway, and it includes all of our cloud assets, whether it's DNA, uh, DNS, proxy, et cetera, and be able to simply, by just a few clicks of the button in vManager on Vitella or Meraki Manager, just route that traffic up into our cloud platform. And so you're protected, whether you're in the branch, mobile, or behind the kind of classic firewall protection inside of HQ. Another classic example of leveraging the underlying network. The last one I'm going to present actually kind of couples the whole thing together around our security portfolio and how we deeply couple it into the network. So our security portfolio is really built in three layers. The foundational piece is Talos. That's that 300 researcher group consuming all this information and making sure we have a single source of truth that is highly uh, accurate. We then have an enforcement and sensor layer, the network, the endpoint, and the cloud. So regardless of where we are, where the threats are, we have a comprehensive view of all of that, sending data back and forth between that enforcement layer and Talos. This has led us to be able to produce a very automated response and really deal with the complexity that our customers are dealing around integration. And I'm gonna take you through that example. But before I do, I want to highlight the top of the stack. So while our customers appreciate the efficacy of the portfolio and the automated nature of Talos and our response, 
more and more customers are asking, hey, gee, can we have a front end around incident, investigation, remediation, detection? Instead of going from portal to portal, can we have a more coherent experience? That top piece is what we're going to demonstrate for you today. You can also see it in the security section. It's built on our advanced malware protection capability. So go check it out. There's a lot of good stuff over there. So let me walk you through how the portfolio works, and then you can kind of see it in detail. We have Talos, we have uh, enforcement, and then we have the management piece. So, Let's take you through uh, the complexity of just the sheer size of the events coming in. An enterprise the size of Cisco, we have thousands of events coming in every single day. So if you're sitting in the chair of that lone defender, a SecOps person, you're getting flooded with events. And when we ask our customers about this, they say that out of a single day, 44% of the alerts are not investigated at all. They just can't get to it. So they would like an ability to prioritize. What are high priority events versus low priority events because they just can't get to them. Of the ones that they do get to, 50% of them, they can't remediate. They run out of time. We have to deal with this through automation. So that once a threat is identified, an event is identified, how can we automate that loop to make sure? And then of course, most surprisingly, is 8% didn't even register the event. The portfolio, remember in that early slide of what we could see, people are very good in individual sections but because we have to integrate, or our, our customers have to integrate this together, the complexity is on the integration. So things get dropped in between going from an email into a sandbox, et cetera. So we have a flood of events that are consuming the SecOps time. We have an inability to automate those things. So even the events that we do see get dropped. And then of course, because you're trying to take these individual products and integrate them together, you get lost and gaps appear. So we've been spending the last few years hard at work integrating the portfolio together with the network. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you through a quick example. I know since you're here at the security venue, that if someone was handing out USB keys, you would not install the USB key and plug it into your computer. I'll just give you a hint. Since you're at the security venue, if someone hands you a USB, do not bring it into your computer. But let's say you, you know, we've all clicked on a website or clicked on email. Somehow your endpoint gets infected. What happens? Well, in, uh, for Cisco, the, our endpoint, advanced malware protection, and for endpoint, sees the event. Could be fi uh, file list, it could be a process, it could be a file, could be all those different things. And the first thing that it does when it sees something new is it goes up to our AMP cloud and says, have you seen this before? Do you have any disposition on this event? And the AMP cloud will come back and say, yes, I've seen it before. It's known good, let it go. Or yes, I've seen it before, it's known bad, and we block it immediately, kill the process or delete the file. Or it says, you know, I'm not really sure. I'm gonna need to think about this a little bit. When that happens, the file automatically gets sent to our sandbox, we detonate it, we look at it in various different ways, and then we prosecute whether it's a threat event or not. If it turns out to be a threat event, we then push that information across the entire portfolio. 
So we'll push new firewall rules, we'll push it into the email proxy, we'll update the, the AMP cloud for endpoint. All of this happens automatically so that people can, for these basic processes, deal with these events. It just happens in the background automatically so to free up time. And uh, as, we, as we go through and kind of push this together, this integration plays a huge role for us. Because again, remember the 8%. Because of the complexity of tying these things together, things get lost. And so I like to kind of think about it as, uh, would you fly an airplane built of 50 different airplanes? The average customer that we have has 40 to 50 security products in there. And coupling these all together is complicated and exposes security risks to our customers. So now that you know the back end, now that you know how the process works, I want to take the remaining time to give you a live example of integrating in the front end the investigate piece, the uh, remediation piece, the detection piece. And for that, I'd like to invite up my colleague, Matt Robinson, who's an expert at all this, to kind of walk us through step-by-step -step on a, a demo live. Matt, come on up. Welcome. All right. Thanks, G. It's good to see you. Good to see you. Okay. So we're going to start today in uh, the uh, AMP for Endpoints console. All right, so you were mentioning AMP for Endpoints. We are uh, basically have an agent out on the endpoints watching what's happening here. Um, so what we see right here as we log into this console is just a basic heat map showing uh, what the compromises might look like in the environment. Um, over here on the right, um, we see comp or detections in cognitive threat analytics. And this is our cloud-hosted analytics engine that you mentioned doing detections on ETA data and, and all that. So we can basically see some detections that are occurring here. But what we're going to do is we're going to click into our inbox. Uh, it says that we have 25 events that require immediate uh, attention. So as we come in here, we can see uh, there's a number of different compromised artifacts in, in this environment, uh, quite compromised, in fact. So we're going to scroll and, and down. Matt, these are all prioritized to yes. get back into that, that yes. event. Yep. Yeah. So as we scroll down, this is a prioritized list. Yep. So we basically, are, we're, what we're going to do is we see uh, basically is this stacked ranked list. We're going to start with this one on the top. It has 65 different incidents, so it um, seems pretty significant and uh, high risk. So as we, we look at it, we see there are a number of different threats detected on on this, this particular host, 65 as I mentioned. Um, so what we're going to do is click into the device trajectory. So the device trajectory is all of the different processes that we've observed running on this device. Um, and we see that all of these incidents are associated with this one executable right here. So as we click on that executable, uh, we see that it is not quarantined currently. And that's because we're running in audit mode right now. So it's not actively quarantined, but it is running on this host. So, but at this point in time, we now have an indicator of compromise. We have a known bad process that is running on this host. And so what we're going to do now is kick off an investigation. We're going to click on this, fo this hash file and we're going to say investigate invisibility. And this is what you were just mentioning. Uh, Cisco visibility is that pane of glass for response orchestration. Um, what it's done is we've come in here on a known bad incident or this uh, indicator of compromise, which is that malicious file. And what visibility has done is it's, it's called out to different APIs across the portfolio, by both our own and third-party APIs, starting with AMP, ThreatGrid, uh, Umbrella, uh, VirusTotal, and we've decorated data against this given incident. So we had this malicious file, we've called those different APIs, and we can see what that file means to our environment. As an incident responder, we have two highest level objectives when we get an indicator of compromise. What did it mean to our business? What was our past exposure? And then what is our ongoing exposure? Can we ha do everything to control our ongoing exposure? So as we look at this incident, this indicator of compromise, this malicious file, we see that it is in fact present only on one host in our network, given what we know from our environment. So we see that it is infected on this host, which is good. We only have one uh, piece of exposure that we know of at this point in time. So we're going to click on this file and we're going to block it going forward. So we're going to say add this SHA-256, which is how the file is identified, to our uh, custom detections block list. So that means that 
everywhere that AMP is in our environment, this file is now blocked. So that's at our email gateways, our web gateways, AMP for endpoints, firepower appliances, firepower threat defense are now actively blocking this file. Okay. So from the network all the way up to layer seven. That's right. Anywhere we have AMP. We're also going, we also notice that this file communicates to this URL. This is probably its command and control channel, but what we can easily do is because we have umbrella, we're going to click on this and we're going to block this domain at the DNS layer. So what that means is that anything that's using our forward resolvers, blocked. No, but that's, this host can no longer resolve its command and control, so we have blocked its lookup. It can no longer communicate home. So anywhere that this file might exist, that we have visibility to it already, we have it blocked. So at this point, we very effectively blocked the ongoing exposure of this particular file. But we still don't really know what it is, and this is part of our past exposure. So we can see over here on the right that there is in fact a sample of this file in ThreatGrid. So we're going to click on that and we're going to see what is this file, what, we have, what have we observed it behave in a sandboxed environment. So we can see that you know, the identifiers of the file and the different behavioral indicators. And right here at the top, we can see this detection uh, that indicates that it's a Trojan malware. In fact, that as we read the description, we can identify that it's a dropper, which means that once it's installed, the attacker is able to drop in other applications or do other actions on that host. So what we want to do now is begin to investigate what else this host has done. And for example, what we've seen a lot of droppers over the last few months be is crypto mining applications. It's a very effective way of monetizing a, uh, an infected host. In fact, you, if you go to the threat wall, you'll probably we see, see some. Absolutely. <laughs> a lot of crypto mining. But, so as we scroll down, uh, we can see the behavioral indicator, not just of this file, but we can also then pivot into StealthWatch. We can take this as a behavioral signature of this file. Uh, we can search for who else might be infected with it, as well as what else has this host done or has anybody else exhibited similar network behavior. Mm. And with that, I'd like to close. Great, well, this, this is fantastic. You. And again, coupling it all together with StealthWatch, eventually DNA Center, so you can start to segment this. Fantastic work. Thank you very much, Thank Matt. Thank you. That's awesome. <laughs> Okay, so in closing, you've seen that it's simple, it's automated, it's open, producing the highest efficacy in the industry. There's a lot of tech that we showed today, a lot of exciting tech that we've shown today. You can see it. You can go into the beer section and hang out with the umbrella folks. You can go into the security section, go into the network section, all of them, as Chuck said, security everywhere. So, Enjoy the rest of your Cisco Live, and I look forward to meeting you in these hangout areas to further the conversation. Thank you very much. Hi, welcome back guys. That was G Rittenhouse with some really interesting points on security. Guys, it is day three at CLUS. How excited are you guys to be in day three? It's customer appreciation night tonight and I'm so excited because you know what? It's at Universal freaking Studios in Florida and I don't know if you know, but there's Harry Potter there and I grew up with Harry Potter and I am so jazzed to be there tonight. I hope there are dragons. I hope there are wands. I hope there are Dementors. But you know what? It's not just about Harry Potter. It's not just about the big party night. There's a lot of networking opportunities here at Cisco Live. So for those of you out there who aren't there, maybe you want to think about coming next year, there's all these after parties after the convention is done at night that you can come network with folks, meet other folks. It's such a good time. Always be hashtagging people who are here at CLUS. We love seeing your stuff on social media, on Twitter, on Instagram, and on Facebook. Folks are getting their wristbands for tonight's appreciation event, so it's going to be super exciting. Another thing that was wonderful about this morning, you know, Annie, Manny, and Steve were talking about corporate social responsibility. That's one of my favorite aspects of Cisco. Um, you know, one of my favorite things about CSR is Dimension Data. Cisco has a partnership with Dimension Data. They do things like connecting um, game ranges so they can help um, 
uh, you know, people from poaching elephants and rhinos. So that's something that's really important to Cisco is just really helping make the world a better place. So we're actually going to be hearing from G Rittenhouse again. I hear that Steve is with G actually at the Innovation Showcase. Steve, let's hear more about security. Absolutely, Stephanie. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. G, that was such a great talk. It was packed out here in the audience. People were incredibly excited. And I think you really nailed what it is. Everything that we're talking about goes to that security is foundational concept. The threat exposure level keeps getting wider and wider. Yep. What was it that you really wanted to target? How do you do this? in 30 minutes, I guess is really what I'm getting at, because there's so much to talk about. So, uh, obviously the threat intelligence is key. It's all about the visibility and Talos. So from that piece, we can then expand on into the individual components. If you want to go in email, you want to go in cloud, but it starts at the network and the network intuitive. That's where we, that's where we begin and end. Absolutely, so anytime we're out on any sort of a security event, right, and we're putting Talos out front and center because we want people to understand what threat intelligence is all about. Yep. How do we begin to have vision toward the future on where Talos is headed? Mm -hmm. We know what we've been talking about up till now. What are the next steps? So the next steps are all about having even higher efficacy. It's all about, it's all about the volume of traffic, massive amounts of volume. 20 billion threat <laughs> events blocked every day. And it only keeps increasing. So as Talos expands both laterally, as new threats come up in the marketplace, it also has to expand expand vertically. And then because of even more traffic and as we start to consume more traffic from the network itself and looking with enhanced uh, 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 encrypted traffic analytics, being able to see that information, sure. seeing detecting malware, even though it's encrypted, a lot of good stuff going on going forward. You know, you've got 20 plus years of, of, of investment in this entire area. You're all about transformation. How do we create better performance, higher performing teams, uh, higher performing businesses? What I love about what you do because you put the security at the center of everything you do, you bring a unique perspective of it that connects that security to all of your experience in this field. Yeah. Um, so how do you approach a talk like this? Well, it's interesting because security is all about innovation. Mm -hmm. We face active adversaries who are modifying their approach every day. So it's about the speed and pace of innovation to deal with those attacks. And so, of course, to do that, you leverage software, and then even further, of course, leverage the cloud and the cloud processing. So it's all about the pace of innovation and pushing it out there quickly. And what a concept that our adversaries are the ones that are actually yeah. forcing us to be better at, at, at what we do. Yeah. How do you think the threat landscape has changed and kind of evolved even over the last maybe two or three years and how do we respond at Cisco? Well, the biggest thing is going from files and malware and execution there into crypto mining. So now that people are taking over computers and crypto mining directly, instead of holding things for ransom, uh, we see a whole new dynamic in the security space. And by the way, that's just going to continue as you go into even more different uh, ways of hijacking the computation element, sure. whether it's in the cloud or on-prem, and, kind of and trying to monetize it that way. Let me ask you to kind of hop into the mind of the person who's really trying to get at that information. I think it used to be, how do we get in, how do we steal what we want, whether it's monetary, whether it happens to be a, uh, a ransomware type of situation. Now we're seeing them get in specifically to wreak havoc and create destruction. Mm -hmm. What do you think is really the driver behind that? There's a couple drivers. First of all, a lot of times it's actually incidental. They were trying to do something else, but they broke something because they didn't know the network well or didn't know, understand the underlying processes. But it's happening more and more because of the internet of things. So it's moving from the IT space and what's happening in your data center into the manufacturing, the OT space. And that of course can be very disruptive as they try to hijack your processing and your manufacturing manufacturing or other kind of business logic uh, instead of just the data piece of it. Now that's a really interesting perspective as well because we always think of this as being something simply on the exposure side, but no, if we go to IoT maybe being a driver, yeah. because now as cloud continues to go further out, we have more and more data touch points, more endpoints, BYOD. Yes. These can actually be contributing to that is what you're saying? Yes, absolutely, because both in the sense of its importance, but it also the threat surface it exposes. 
you know, the famous example of earlier this year where a fish tank thermometer was connected to the internet for re valid reasons, but it was also connected to the corporate network mm. and not segmented. So people were able to exploit that weakness and funnel data out of the enterprise. So the, the tax surface and being able to check every thermometer, every light, every fish tank is becoming complex. Right, as we get more complicated. And we are, we're all about simplification at yes. Cisco. I mean, this is what we want to do. But the reality is we are making things more complex because we're creating more opportunities yeah. for people. I want to tie this back into Chuck because so much of what we've been trying to discuss is how things run from Chuck and his vision and his keynote through the campus directly out to the innovation showcases. So if we go back to this idea, security is foundational, and we talk about the network and what role security plays in connecting to the network, mm -hmm. how does Cisco view that and what's our strategy moving forward from now? So there's a couple elements to it. First of all, this isn't new. We've been using the network as a protection device for decades, firewalls, segmentations. The problem with that approach was you had to build rules specific to every security threat. So customers have thousands or millions of ACL policies and things. They don't, they can't touch it because they know that if they scrub it, they may break something. So it just keeps accumulating over time. With the network intuitive, when you abstract out the policy, where you're not going into the rules, you're going into the intent, then you can remove, if all of a sudden the intent changes, you can remove that, and it happens automatically. So as we move from the kind of detailed nuances of the network into the more abstracted layers, whether it's on a firewall, whether it's in identity, whether it's in access, et cetera, or the application, we've now been able to simplify that using DNA Center, using Security Intuitive, and the, and the assets that we bring there to help simplify and automate on behalf of our customers. But again, that automation is complexity, so as we simplify on the surface, like all things, the yeah. easier it is to use, the more complicated it is to create. Let me ask you a little bit about uh, security in the SD-WAN space. We're about to kind of change our direction to that. What are your thoughts there? It it's actually makes it much simpler for us because with SD-WAN, our customers are having more direct internet access from the branch. And so they're actually asking for more cloud services. And of course, Cisco provides those every day. But when you tunnel from a thousand branches into a cloud protection, that can get complicated. The SD-WAN fabric allows that to be programmatic. With a few simple clicks of the button, you can say, send this traffic, MPLS to HQ, send this one to the cloud security, Cisco's cloud security portfolio, or send it directly into the, uh, into the internet. Very, very cool. So much to consider. Gee, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, and I know. Pleasure. Thank you so much. You've already been a very busy man this yeah, morning, so we yeah. truly appreciate Thank the time and talking pleasure. to us. Keep getting down to these innovation showcases. This is where the thought leadership takes place, right here in this theater in the corner of the Waz. Stephanie, we're going to toss it back upstairs to you right now. Hey, Steve, great interview with G. Thanks Steve, so can I thank ask you, thank you and thanks for stepping in, I didn't what know is it like here. being oh, in the I'm innovation studio. Out of the studio? Hey, Steve, what is it like being in the innovation showcase? Tell me about it. You know, the energy in the innovation showcase, so G doesn't have a, a wire in his ear, so uh, Stephanie just asked me, she's up in Studio B, she said, what is the innovation showcase like? This is the first time I've had a chance to come down after one of the talks instead of being in the studio. What's great is it's incredibly open, first of all, so it feels very deeply connected to what's happening here in the WAS, which means that I think as we look out and we see these 300 plus partners out on the show floor, they can stay connected to what we're talking about in our thought leadership. But you just finished a talk. What was your experience of being up in here? So the great thing about it is being open like this, you can actually point. Hey, this is cool technology. Right over there, go check it out. Go talk to the engineers. Or hey, this is cool, go over there and talk to the engineers or talk with this partner. It's because you're right in the middle of it, very easy to just couple the dots together. Absolutely, makes storytelling so much stronger. So Stephanie, I know you've been down here as well, but everybody, check your app, make sure that you schedule in the innovation showcases because every one of these talks, it's going to be a game changer and a mind changer that gets you thinking outwardly about a more collective capability, all right? 
Thank you so much, Steve. All right, we're going to learn more about security at the branch with Annie, who is also in the WAS. Annie, can you tell us more about security at the branch? Sure thing, Stephanie. You know, we talked earlier during the Innovation Showcase about how the attack surface is expanding. That means even at the remote sites and locations, also affectionately known as the branch, we at Cisco have a, a software-defined WAN solution for branch. I'm here with Barry Fisher. Fisher. We're here at the World of Solutions right in front of the branch solutions stop right here. We're going to talk a little bit, Barry, you want to tell me about what we are doing to help branches stay networked but securely networked together. Yeah, sure, Annie. Well, businesses are embracing the cloud, and that means that applications are shifting away from the data center to multiple clouds, whether it's Google, Office right. 365, Box, AWS. Right. But then you also have a lot of non-traditional users such as guests and devices such as IoT that are connecting at tens to thousands of these branch locations. Right. And that's adding a lot of stress to the wide area network, which when you think about it, we architected two decades ago. Right. And so for the IT team, there's increasing cost and complexity, and then that's causing with all this IT skill shortage that we're trying to deal with, a lot of delays and disruptions to them enabling new cloud, IoT, general business digitalization projects. So normally when we talk about when and branch, those things go hand in hand together, right? We have to connect all of those branch offices back to headquarters through some type of a circuit. Talk a little bit about how those WAN connectivity to the branch works today. Yeah, so typically what a customer would do is they'd buy a lease line for each of their branch circuits and they'd get that from a global service provider such as Level 3. Okay. And that service provider, that will allow them to carry voice, video, and other application traffic site to site and between regional data centers. Uh, and the other advantage is that they are running a private network, which will assure application performance and privacy. But it's coming at a steep price, it's rigid, and it's really optimized around applications that lived in the data center, not in the clouds. Right, so we're trying to make something that looks like a point-to-point -point circuit, act like a point-to-point -point circuit, but doesn't cost as much as a point-to-point -point circuit, right? Right. So what are more, what's, what, what we're gonna lead up to this, what is yeah. a more agile and cost-effective approach then for them? Yeah, so what customers are doing most of them are augmenting, but a few might even decide to replace that private MPLS uplink with a public internet uplink. And so that way uh, you can be able to have a hybrid WAN, but that's not just enough because our existing branch routers, they don't have enough scalability, compliance, and security when we're going to try to connect site to site and have a direct internet access. And so to be able to do that, that's where we bring in software-defined WAN architectures, right? Now, with in some cases, in a click of a button, you can create a mesh across all your sites with security, and you can have a business policy that says these users, these devices, or these applications can have direct internet access. So not just these users and these applications use this circuit, but we can automatically decide based on security, based on cost, based on availability, which goes where, not statically defined exactly. that. Exactly, totally independent. It's all based on the policy says, I want an amazing user experience. That's what the network will provide to your branches. Yeah, so so typically we talk about all these things, we talk about when, we talk about scale, we talk about distribution. We said a little bit about security, expand on that because yeah. we just came out of the innovation showcase right. talk, listening about the attack surface, listening about threat intelligence. We talk about secure branch. Right. We kind of make that shift into that story. There. Yeah, and there's a lot of risk both externally and internally to the branch when you're allowing that direct internet access. The way we mitigated in the past was we were backhauling everything to the data center, right? There we racked and stacked a whole list of different security appliances. But that's not going to scale when we're going to be shifting now to 1,000 or more direct internet access breakouts. So Cisco's solution to this is we're going to be embedding advanced security directly into the SD-WAN router that we're going to be deploying at the branch, and we're combining that with cloud security. We have a secure internet internet gateway, that's awesome. called Cisco Umbrella, and that will be securing the cloud. And so it's this open, integrated, branch to cloud edge architecture that will provide the flexibility our customers need, because they're going to have small versus large offices, low risk versus high risk offices, and they might need different solutions depending on. So we don't have to sacrifice anything. So thank you so much, Barry. We're about to start into our next innovation showcase. We're going to throw back to Stephanie. How's it going? Hey, Annie, thank you so much. 
such interesting information about security. We are going to be going to the Innovation Showcase soon with Susie Wee, she is the VP and CTO of DevNet, to talk about the newest innovations, learning how to develop on APIs, and all of that good stuff. Um, Susie's going to show demos, she's going to walk us through some sandbox testing opportunities and telling us everything about, to be, um, about how to be a network champion. So for those of you who want to be a network champion, please go to the Innovation Showcase or watch right here on Cisco TV, um, and we will go to Susie right about now. Chief Technology Officer of DevNet at Cisco Systems, 